Uh, for about 10 years, uh, had some very promising results, uh, but we never quite got into the, uh, over the cusp of trying to develop a, a viable market, never quite got industry support to really do it, to continue on with some of the things that we thought that needed to be done. And so, and a couple other things happened uh, in my life that, one, I became a department head for three years for the university, so which kind of diverted me away from doing much, as much research as I once did. And so, consequently, uh, we mothballed the program, the soybean program, in 2009. And so, one of the things that has, has happened here recently has been an opening up of, of a market. Uh, for those of you that, uh, that may not be familiar, United Grains down at, uh, at Pompey's, uh, is going to be forward contracting uh, soybeans in this coming production season after the first of the year uh, based on, on using the futures market for spot price market price uh, minus a basis and currently their basis is 80 cents a bushel that they're charging on that. And so we, uh, and so there's been a lot of renewed interest. I think obviously, in fact I'm, I'm getting into my talk here, I probably just, just need to get up to the next slide here. Because a lot of the interest that I think that's being generated by, by soybeans is, is that everything, obviously, at, uh, in our commodities have a lower price than they did just a, just a couple of years ago. But most of those commodities, particularly the small grains, the corn, et cetera, they're probably at best at half of what their peak prices were, and, and in many cases, they're well below half. And whereas soybeans have been holding their own a little bit better than a lot of the other commodities, uh, today the market is at ten dollars and and I think ten dollars and thirty seven cents and so that's about sixty five seventy percent of where it was at when it was at, at peak price here in, in, uh, in 2013. So consequently there's more interest in that because of the value of the crop relative to, to other commodities. Uh, we now have a market that's opening up and so uh, there's been lots of questions and so I'm happy to come out and talk about about soybeans. Uh, one of the things I brought as a handout is this little document here that we wrote back in 2004. Uh, some of the information in here is dated, particularly, well, the variety test information for sure is because none of the varieties that are on these sheets or very few of them would be available today for production. But I did want, I decided to go ahead and include these because we are going to be talking about, I've got some slide shots of some of these varieties and, and how they performed at Huntley. Uh, but the more important thing is that there's a good, this was my best attempt to write up a, a short little description of soybean maturity groups because that's going to be a very important aspect of, of the types of varieties that you're going to choose to grow if you are interested in soybeans because you can either give up some yield potential by picking the wrong maturity group or you can get yourself into trouble and not have any crop produce at all by right, choosing the wrong maturity group. We're going to discuss that in a little bit of detail here. Uh, soybeans are what we define as a short day crop uh, species. In other words, as an annual crop, most there's three different types of annual crops uh, in terms of their response to day length. There's long day crops, and the classic one that you would be accustomed to would be winter wheat. Winter wheat responds to switching from what we call um, uh, from from uh, to into what we call reproductive growth in other words is it is responding to successively longer days okay then there's crops that tend to be day neutral and, and a good example of that is uh, both corn number two yellow corn or or most of our uh, barley varieties are day neutral they don't care what the day length is they're going to respond mostly to heat units, and so within a given period of time, if, they're, if, if temperatures are warm enough and they develop a, up to a certain stage, they're going to go ahead and switch over in, into what we call reproductive growth and will produce grain. Then the third one is short day, and on short day species, they are going to respond to successfully, successively shorter days. And, and so if you're living in the northern hemisphere, when does that benchmark happen? June 21st. And so we're talking about a crop that's not even going to think about producing flowers or pods or, or switching gears until we get into the latter part of June. Okay. What happens in our dryland country in this part of the world 
let's say July 1, just because of the date. It turns to dry, yes. And so consequently, because of this, we've tried to grow soybeans in a dry land scenario at Huntley several times. And we've gone from producing a 60 bushel crop per acre to a 60 pound crop, pounds, understand, one bushel per acre at best. And the reason for that is because at the very worst time you can stress a crop from the standpoint of grain production is, 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 in, is expose it to a moisture stress situation as it's starting to initiate <coughs> flowers or floral reproductive. And of course, it's a perfect matchup for soybeans to be a disaster in our dryland scenario most years. Okay. Now we have had some years here, if you believe in global warming, we're, there's, there, it's being forecasted, there is a trend for, for more precipitation later into the summer than that we've experienced in the past. But uh, it's, I would not bank on that, you know, in, at least in this part of the world, where we exist in this, what I call the, uh, the Chinook Belt of, of central Montana. We're simply going to continue to have, I think, that feast and famine experience in, in that midsummer drought that we're kind of accustomed to. By the way, and now as you go east of here, we switch gears from a uh, what I call a winter and spring uh, precipitation pattern to one that's that's more of a spring and summer type precipitation pattern. If you look at the the historical weather records for Huntley and compare it, say, to Weibo, okay, both of those are on average get somewhere around 13, 13 and a half inches of rain per year. Same same annual amount of rain. At Huntley, in the months of June and July, we average about two inches com combined between those two months. It's about four to four and a half at Weibo, Montana. And so as you switch, as you go farther east into North Dakota, your precipitation levels pick up. That, that pattern continues to go to more of a summer type pattern, and so that's why in, you know, in parts of North Dakota they, they can do things that we can't do in mid to late summer on a dryland scenario than we can here in Montana. Okay, let's get back into soybeans here. So, as if we pick a line anywhere, now uh, in, in the discussion, the creation of what we call maturity groups were defined by their adaptation to a particular latitude. And so if we just draw a line anywhere in the United States, we know that as we move north, uh, our days are going to be longer for any, for any kind of period of time in the summer months. As we move south, those are going to be shorter day lengths, okay, for, for any given time. And so, in order to adjust for that, uh, our breeders were able to identify germplasm. Initially, I believe they had, the, they had soybeans divided into three different maturity groups, then they went to five. And then what you, the map that you see here, which is also duplicated in here, is the modern version of this, where, where we have, they have uh, varieties uh, subdivided into maturity groups Initially, that was in Roman numerals 1 through 9. In fact, they created 10 of those. The 10th one is down here uh, in the tropics, down here. Uh, in the United States, we, the, the definition was 1 through Roman numeral 9. And then as breeders got, got good at identifying uh, germplasm throughout the world and, in, and integrating that into our variety program, they were able to come up with shorter and shorter material. And so that resulted in what we call the single zeros the double zeros, the triple zeros, and I understand in the in the maritime provinces of Canada up here uh, that they actually have uh, quad zeros type varieties. And so the the what we in Montana, you, know, you notice that these maps kind of have a curve in them uh, on these adaptation lines. And so when we got into this business with looking at soybeans and how well were they adapted to the Yellowstone River Valley. The first thing we had to do was figure out what maturity groups were going to fly in this country. And he would say, well, this is pretty easy to determine because it looks like, uh, you know, we're about at the same latitude as, as Minneapolis, uh, St. Paul, and so therefore we should probably be growing maybe a group one, maybe some group zero, single zeros. Um, and in some ways that, that's kind of where we started. We use that as the benchmark. But there's some other mitigating circumstances here that, that also apply. Uh, if we look at altitude, and this is related to temperature. If we look at altitude, uh, can anyone, does anyone here know what the elevation drop is as the Mississippi runs from, from uh, Minneapolis down to the Gulf? 
1,000 feet. That's a good round number. It's about 1,000 feet. Do I have that on there? Yay, hey, you guessed right. It's about 1,000 feet. Okay. What is the elevation difference between Minneapolis and Billings? 2,000 feet. Yeah, I'll say 2,000. That's what I have there, 2,000, depending on where you're at. And so how, what impact does this have? Well, there's what we call the, the, uh, the adiabatic lapse. As you rise in elevation, there's a, on app, your average temperature per year drops about one degree for every 100 feet that you rise in elevation. And so uh, it doesn't actually work out com that linearly all the time, but, but, but the bottom line is, Without a doubt, we're going to be experiencing much cooler temperature regimes in Billings, Montana than they are in, in Minneapolis, and definitely much more so than they are in, in New Orleans. And so all of this interacts with maturity groups, elevation, and so what we decided to do was the shotgun approach was, was to grow a whole bunch of varieties with different maturity groups and see which ones were the most successful. Also, from year to year, uh, our, our seasonal crop conditions at, in Montana are quite variable. I mean, the old, I grew up in Montana and they say if you don't like the weather, wait five minutes, it'll change, you know, and that's exactly true. What we have here is, is a comparison of frost-free days. Now the red line is the long-term average for the station at Huntley. Uh, on average, we have 126 frost-free days and uh, we hope those are consecutive. Okay, that's an old joke. Okay, we'll, we'll, quit, we'll, 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 we'll get, we'll, go, we'll move on from there. It works in the flathead where I grew up <laughs> because, because we have 90 days, you know, they go, oh, yeah. Okay, and then on, in terms of growing degree days, and, we're, and here this is GDD 50, so we're using a 50 base uh, for that. Uh, we have an average of uh, 1,927, so that's what this red line here represents. And you would think, okay, on years that we have more frost-free days, we're automatically going to have more heat units, and, and sometimes that's the truth. Uh, uh, like, for instance, in, in 2000, 2001, we had longer years and then we had more heat units. But then all of a sudden you get into some years where you have fewer frost-free days, but the temperatures were hotter. Uh, and then you get, you still have uh, a greater than average accumulation of heat units. Uh, here, 26 days, we should have had a whole, we should maybe have had a thousand more heat units and that certainly wasn't the case. Uh, and so basically we're kind of all over the board. You can't predict what you're going to get. So. This is what made us decide to maybe look at soybeans over about a 10 year period of time. You don't need to look at that face. Okay, so what I'm gonna go through is some pictures here of, of some soybean maturity group types. I have the varieties listed down below. And I'm gonna show you what these look like at Huntley. Now this would be on our killing frost date on average at Huntley, which if I remember right is September 21st. And so we went out in the field, on average, we should be experiencing a killing frost on this date. Okay, we're gonna go through the maturity groups. Now, you're gonna see these designations here. This is maturity group, this is double zero. This is a very early maturity group of varieties. The decimal point represents, uh, basically each tenth represents a day difference in maturity. And this is, this is a rating that's provided by the company or the breeder that's involved in the development of that. And it's all based on looking at the maturity of these things uh, in relation to what would be called check varieties. And so we don't come up with these numbers. These were provided to us. And so these two lines, these, are, these were released by North Dakota State University many, many years ago. This is a Daxoy, which was a, a double zero. That's the, te that's the terminology here, double zero point seven and Jim double zero point eight. So there, there should be a difference of about a day here. But on, but on September 21st, both of these varieties are dead ripe. Okay, they're harvest ready at that point in time. You see some green leaves here, but in fact this is incursion from the, from the plots along the sides here. So that's what we have there. Okay, maturity group zero, single zero. And so we have some representation here. This is a uh, this was a public variety out of North Dakota, uh, 0, 0.0. So this would be the earliest of the single zero groups. And you can see that there are still some leaves hanging onto those plants. Whereas if we go back to the double zeros, there are no leaves left there on those plants. So, this, so even though this is, 
Jim here is a, is a double 0 0.8. There should only be three days difference between that one and this one, but obviously there's more of a difference here than what, what the ranking lets you. Mid, zero, 0 0.5, council, and then surge, which was kind of a test mule for us for a number of years, 0 0.9. So you can see even in this single, in this single zero maturity group, you have leaves turning and dropping on this end of the spectrum, and you have basically what are considered full green plants down here. Group ones, and, and on the day of our, what we would expect to be our first frost, you can see on a group one, there's no difference out there. They're all green, green is gourd, okay. Now, there are some subtle differences that you can't see in these photos because on almost every one of the, well, particularly on this one down here, but even on the, on the council where you see some leaves starting to turn yellow, and to a lesser degree on the surge, almost every one of those plants has got pods near the bottom that are already starting to turn color. And so what we have discovered is that if you start to see, if, if you get a killing frost, but at least half of the pods on the plants have already started to turn color, it's been our experience that those pods on that mother plant will continue to ripen and you'll have virtually no green seed, which is considered a deleterious grading factor in the grain. We have not experienced, at least with a single group maturity, single zero maturity groups, we have not experienced a problem with green seed. That's not been the case on the group ones. Okay. And I don't know, I don't think I have a picture of, of, uh, of group twos. No, I don't. Group twos make a great forage variety for this country. Okay. Uh, but we have had a killing frost, and so you can see by the time we have a killing frost uh, that we had, in, and I forget when we had this in, in, in I think this was shot in 2004, uh, and, and wait, you know, just a couple, three weeks later, uh, pretty much everything is dried down. So you can even, even at that point, you can still harvest this, but again, you run with a maturity group one, you're going to have some risk of green seed in the grain. Okay, any questions on that? So what should you be growing? Let's see if I got that slide. I don't think I have that slide. Long term, our experience has shown that if you're going to grow beans as a full season crop in order to maximize the yield, you should be growing something in that late single zero maturity group. Like six to nine, six to eight. Zero point, zero point seven, zero point eight, zero point nine. Okay, at, then that's at Huntley. And I don't think, and you know, I've looked at weather records over time, uh, at least Harden here is not a whole lot different in terms of temperature regimes than I've seen in Huntley. Or in fact, they actually track pretty close. It surprises me at times. And so basically these, these two would be, would be benchmarks to the, you know, bookmarks for, for that type. However, everybody that I've talked to that, that is, is a, that's interested in soybeans but also says, well, yes, but I don't want it to interfere with sugar beet harvest, or I don't want it to interfere with corn harvest. Well, a lot of corn gets harvested after, is now, I guess, so that ain't gonna worry, that's not gonna be an issue. But, they're, but they are concerned about the fact that these things are gonna be coming off, they're gonna be harvested typically in mid to late October. And so they've asked the question, what can we do to manage around that? Well, the question is quite simple. You grow an earlier maturity group. Um, I can guarantee you that this one will be fully dry in the absence of a killing frost before the rest, before these two are. And of course, in this particular year, the double zeros were. And if you want to back it up even more, you could go to a triple zero. And so as it turns out, we have had some growers express some interest in that. Understand that by picking a maturity group that matures earlier, you're going to be giving up yield potential. Okay, so speaking of yield potential, so what is that? Uh, so from 1999 up until 2009, we, we, we had a number of, of yield trials looking at a number of different entries, and you can see there's the entry number there. They varied from, I think the low was, well, this last one here, and this was mostly uh, food type beans. Uh, but most of these were in the, you know, we had 30, 40, 50, as much as 62 different entries that we were testing at. Uh, this was the yield trial. Uh, results the mean over here. Uh, so in this particular case, all, these 42 averaged 54.4, .4, 
And then we uh, have in among these 42, we always picked out four to five or six check varieties, which we kept that we grew in all of these trials over the years. And you can see that those were tracking fairly closely to the to the trial yield. Uh, in some cases, we had some entries that outperformed the checks, uh, but for the most part, they tracked pretty good down there. Long-term averages over this period of time. 64 for a trial average, 64 and a half for the checks. So I've been saying yield potential for soybeans in this country under irrigation is going to be in that 60 to 65 yield. And in some years where we pick up a few extra growing day, three days, a few extra heat units, that could increase. Do you have a chart comparing this yield to your temperature days? As in your growing You know, I've tried to correlate that, and I can't get it to correlate. Because I know down south, like in Alabama, they have lots of trouble. They plant a very long variety because when it's too hot, they just drop the blooms. And we yeah, have well, yeah. Hot days in fact, in fact, in, in fact, in, you know, if you went down to, uh, yeah, in fact, they, in fact, in some of those areas, they, they grow soybeans. Um, they plant them, you know, midwinter, hoping that they'll that they'll be induced to switch over from, you know, to flower before those days get long enough in the spring. And so that's kind of a horse race. The other thing is that um, uh, at, the, at maturity group, anything that's longer than maturity group four, if I remember this right, is what we call an indeterminate type bean. And, we're, and those that are in group threes and earlier are, are determinate types. And so there are very, very distinctive different variety sets there that you're dealing with. You know, between the two. So, but no, I haven't got it to correlate very well, and I and the reason for that is because I can't get heat units to correlate with frost-free days because we have these phenomena. You know, like we ha we have uh, short warm years, long cold years. Does that vary a lot with their nighttime temperature? Are we losing a lot of heat units some years with? 50 degree nights? Well, I think to be honest, well, that might be, but I think actually that's to our benefit because I think, you know, when I tell, talk to people about our yield potential of 60, 65, they said, God, you know, in fact, that just happened last week. I was talking to a farmer from southern Minnesota. And he says, if I could grow 65 bushel beans, he says, I would, that's all I would grow on my farm. And I think the difference is, is because of our nighttime temperature regime does fall off into the, in, into the six. I think 50s are getting a little bit too cold because that's kind of approaching the cardinal temperature for growth on soybeans. But I think this, our secret to success is that with our nighttime temperatures, we're not losing anything from what we call nighttime respiration. I mean, all plants respire 24-7. During the day, they're, they're producing more sugars than they're consuming through photosynthesis, through what we call net photosynthesis, okay? But at nighttime, a lot of crops, uh, you know, in fact, sugar beets fall into the same sort of thing. At nighttime, if the nighttime temperatures stay elevated, then you're going to see reduced yields. And I forget what year it was. It was, was it 2013, 2014 uh, on the sugar beet crop. We couldn't figure out why all of a sudden sugars went to hell in a handbasket in the last 30 days. And so what I did is I tracked what our nighttime temperatures were during that period of time, and, the, and they were all in the positive side. We had much warmer nights, like up to eight or nine degrees warmer, which is pretty significant over that period of time. And in my mind, I think we lost that sugar because the plants were respiring during that period of time. I gotta watch the time because I, I do have to be back in Huntley by 4.30 or else I'm walking home to Billings. <laughs> of all days, the body shop calls up last night at 5 p.m. and says, we need, my wife's car needed some new sunroof put in because it's a little protracted story. I had a sunroof explode in a car going down the interstate. <laughs> and I was in it. It sounded like a grenade going off. But anyway, they called last night. They said, the part's in. We want your car tomorrow morning at 7.30. So I'm scrambling. My wife has my pickup truck and all the stuff that I usually take to work and everything. So I had a friend haul me to work, and now he's going to take me home. Worst case scenario, I'm going to world. Oh, okay, then we'll be okay. We'll be if you miss it, I'll give you a ride. We'll be safe then. Okay. Yeah, that's right. No, you get rid of both of us. Okay, so yield potential. We talked about yield potential. Quality. In the Midwest, 
If they're happy, if they get 16% oil content in their, in their soybeans, the, the plants are happy back there. 16, 16 and a half, 17 is almost unheard of. So what have we been running? As you can see, our averages over this period of time have, are all above 18%. And in fact, we had one year where we were at 19 and a half percent. Oil quality is not an issue on a soybean crop grown in the Yellowstone River Valley. And I'll be honest, I think this is one of the reasons why Pompey's, I think, might be interested in this, because they're not taking these back to the Midwest. They're shipping them to the West Coast. And I think that's one of the reasons. Protein content. Uh, industry likes to see 36 to 38 percent. And, uh, and you understand these, these are processors that are extracting oil. And so they're selling oil mostly historically into the culinary market, but now almost all the biodiesel in the United States is being produced from soybean oil. Uh, but then, of course, the other co-product of that is, is defatted soybean meal. And, and so they, like to, they still like to see at least 36 and expect it to be somewhere between 36 and 38. And you see the numbers up there. Protein is not an issue. We've only had one year. Actually, that looked like we were going to get below 38. But at, on average, always above 38. And in some years, you know, uh, like in this particular year, over 42%. And there are differences in varieties for this trait, but the companies that sell soybean seed really don't advertise that. I have, I've yet to see protein ratings on, on soybean seed. Uh, as it turned out, uh, I mentioned that Surge, that one from South Dakota, I don't think it's on the market anymore. That was one of our test mules because consistently that, that thing came in at 18.5% at oil content. And, and almost always was at 40% protein. It was, it was phenomenal. And that's actually why we got started into soybeans, because I thought this would be attractive for us to use soybeans as a protein source uh, for our livestock industry. You know, since we're in the, in the Yellowstone and, 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 and Bighorn River Valleys, where there are livestock feeding operations, and I thought, well, you know, here's a chance, maybe open up a chance for them to use this without the expense and cost of, of buying meal. But it's a chicken and an egg thing. You've got to get enough people to grow enough beans to make sure that they don't run short and then nobody's going to grow beans unless they know there's a market and how much they're going to offer. You know, it's the same thing. And you still need the industry to process it. You're not feeding whole beans. You could, though. You could, though. Yeah. yeah. I thought you had to kill that trypsin inhibitor. Not on cattle. Not on ruminant animals. Oh, you no, do no, not. No, no, no. Yeah. Only on monogastric animals do you have to do you have to heat the bean or cook the bean to to denature that trypsin inhibitor. But ruminant animals don't need it. Now it turns out that the reason why they thought that that trypsin inhibitor was still a problem in beef cattle is that if you roasted whole beans and fed them, you had a, you did have a, an improvement in feed efficiency. As it turns out, it has nothing to do with the trypsin inhibitor. What it has to do with is that. As you roast those beans and you caramelize those proteins with the sugars that are in there already, you create an increase of what they call bypass protein, which gets absorbed in the gut farther down the animal, and you, and you pick that up, and that's why it, you get a little slightly better kick from that. But, but you can feed beef cattle all day long. And so I, you know, I talked to Dan Vogel, and he said, I would love to feed a pound of beans a day to my animals. He says, plus he says, the, the calories I would get from the oil he says, I think this would be marvelous. He says, but where am I going to find them if I'm not going to truck them in from, <laughs> from South Dakota? So that's the old chicken and the egg thing I was referring to. Okay. So then you know, we started to do is look at some cultural management. I'm not going to go into all of this, but we're going to show you. Uh, so we did look at soybean population and row spacing because the big question is what kind of equipment investment do you need to be to get into bean production, soybean production, excuse me. And so if you're a farmer that tends to, you know, if you're a small grains farmer, malt barley farmer, you're going to have a drill. So we had 6 inches. Uh, we had 12 inches. Uh, if, you're, uh, if you call yourself a sugar beet farmer, then you're going to be somewhere in the 22 or 24 inch row spacing. And if you're a corn farmer, oil in this country, you're going to still be using 24s probably. But, but it, you know, Midwest, that by definition, 30 inch row spacing. And so we did this study with a number of different populations. 
And as you can see, uh, there was really was not a whole lot of difference in row spacings except in the six inch where uh, in at least in two of the three years it out yielded uh, the other row spacings. Uh, but particularly in 2003, we got a big kick from having a six inch uh, going to a more narrow row spacing. They do seem to be more responsive and particularly responsive to population changes. And so what I've done here on this slide, I'm going to explain, take a few seconds here to explain this. Uh, what we have here are three, what we call regression curves. And so this is classical uh, in, in terms from the standpoint of crop physiology. As you increase population, regardless of the row spacing, you're going to continue, you're going to see an increase in yield up to a certain point where you hit what we call a yield plateau. And as you continue to drive up that population, you create more what we call intraspecific competition, in other words, competition between the plants, the crop plants themselves, then you will eventually drive that yield down off the backside. And so what we were looking for was where these plateaus occurred, and here you can see this is the 24 inch curve, the 30 and the 12, and there's not a whole lot of difference in that that, that plateau happens somewhere right, right in this area between about 130, 140, and, and 160,000 plants per acre, and this is on on actual plant counts that we did for that. Not just seeding rates. Not just seeding rates, that's on established crop, that's exactly right. What happens at six? Well at six you actually see a big shift up, you see more yield potential and then also that plateau happens at more around 160 to 200 thousand plants per acre. So our recommendation is that if you, if you are going to go with a more narrow row spacing you can support more plants out there than you can than if you want to grow them in rows. interesting in the rows how much light's in the ground yeah that's part but you're also you're concentrating those plants more of them into a linear foot of row which means you're in, again you're increasing competition with those you know uh, so uh, he, this was this was a study we conducted uh, this is in 2006 uh, was the kind of at the culmination of this where we were looking at the rotational effects of of uh, soybeans versus, in this particular case, we were using wheat as the al alternative rotation crop. And so the gold bars represent, this is, this is yield of irrigated small grain yields. This is in fact both the average of wheat and barley. Uh, and in this particular case, the previous crop on the gold bars was soybeans, the previous crop uh, on the green bars was wheat. And so, and then on, on each of those combinations, we then applied nitrogen uh, at 0 to 160 units per acre in 40 unit increments. And what you can see is that in almost all cases that uh, where we had small grains on soybeans, the yields were higher. And that the yield of wheat, we had to put on about 120 units of N to achieve the same thing we had by putting on 40 units of N on soybean residue. So we were getting, after about three years in the rotation, we were getting about an 80 unit credit. And the reason why I'm showing this data for 2006 is because we started the study in 2003, 4, 5. It takes about three years for this to kick in. We're not, you know, there, there's some, you know, if you look at Midwest data, they, they say everything mineralizes within, within a production year. And we found out that that's not the case. That's not the case. So, so that's what we have there. So, uh, I'm going to show you, now, in, since 2009, we haven't stopped growing soybeans. Instead, what I've done is I've incorporated them into my irrigation rotation, uh, where I'm the primary variety tester at Huntley, so I have the rotation set up where I'm flip-flopping back and forth between sugar beets and small grains. And then as part of that, we're, we're including soybeans as kind of an interim in, insert in between that. So we're growing a whole block of soybeans just for the sake of growing the soybeans. We're not looking at them from the standpoint of varieties or anything like that. And so I've got some examples here of how we've been, well, how, what we've done with that. Uh, I, got a, I got a scan here because I can't remember what year this was. 2012, okay. So what we did is we started out in this particular year, uh, Montana seed down there on, uh, on um, on uh, Minnesota, uh, we bought from them uh, this brand of Mustang seeds. It was a Roundup Ready 2. Relative maturity rating was 0 0.8. We planted those. 
180,000 pure live seed per acre. That was the 10 acres that we seeded for that. Uh, we didn't put any fertilizer on that year. We had a seven part per million on, on, on phosphorus. Uh, we not inoculated, and by the way, if you're getting into soybeans, and if you've never grown them before, you will need to inoculate them with the proper bacteria, Brady rhizobium, in order for them to develop nodules and fix nitrogen. Planted on May 8th and 9th, there's some costs that we had associated with the planting and the inoculation. Uh, irrigated those twice that year. Harvested them on October 31st. Uh, the harvest moisture as they came off the combine was 9%. Yield was 26 or 63.7. Uh, we, had sh we shipped those to uh, Wagner, South Dakota. It cost us about a buck a bushel to ship those as a, as a backhaul. Uh, we wound up paying a checkoff fee to South Dakota soybeans. But basically my net on that after I took out uh, uh, the, the shipping and our planting cost uh, was $8,500 on 10 acres. And this is the best we've ever done. And the reason for that is because you see the price there. We caught we caught that peak, fourteen dollars and sixteen cents a bushel. Okay. Now that's pretty rosy, but I'm not going to paint a very rosy world for you, year in year out. Okay. Uh, I believe this was last year in 2015. Uh, we switched gears and we, and we bought uh, Garst variety again at 0 0.8. Planted that at 175, four and a half acres. Uh, we did put some, some monoammonium phosphate on for P205, 40 pounds of that. Uh, harvested that, moisture, harvest moisture content 10%, 63.7, we, again we had to pay to ship them to Wagner, and on four and a half acres that was $1,900, so that's about a little over $400 an acre that we netted on that. A little bit different picture from the previous year. This past year, Pioneer Variety 0 0.9, uh, my farm farmer decided to bump the seeding rate just to skosh, five acres we had in rotation, and we put on a little less map. I'm going to skip down here to the bottom. Price, okay, now we just sold these. I just opened up this, I just got these numbers today, just opened up the mail this morning and there was the check. So we are paying 80 cents basis. Uh, Okay, so market price on the on the day we delivered those was 1031 minus 80, so we're getting 943 a bushel. Uh, so our net is uh, just a little under $500 an acre. So that gives you three examples, what I consider to be real world examples. If you can hit just the same old thing you've been told all your life: sell high, buy low, sell high, buy low. So, and like you, I'm not very well, I shouldn't say that. You're better at this than I am, but... Okay. Very good yield potential for early maturing soybeans cultivated in the irrigated areas of, of South Central Montana. Uh, I've maintained that the data that we generate at Huntley is applicable at the very least from, from Huntley, I mean not from Huntley, but from Park City, uh, pretty much all the way to the east until probably maybe to Mile City, but as you know, uh, you get beyond Mile City, the river start valley starts to turn north, and of course we're changing latitudes. And, and I know that our stuff has not worked all that well at Glendive, so but it should still be have application here, because actually, on in terms of latitude, we're about the same as we are at Huntley. I mean, the river has it still has gone a little bit farther to the north, so it should still work quite well. Mid to late maturity groups likely possess the best yield potential most years. Those are the ones that are going to. You know that I that I'm telling you you need to if that you, that's what you're looking for. Maturity ones, okay. If you do get warmer, longer yields. In fact, you, I don't know if you saw that one photo where we hit, kind of hit an 80 bushel mark. That was a longer, warmer year. Uh, had enough moisture in the soil, and we did hit some some 80 bushel beans that year. But that's one in 11 years, so. That's kind of what do you have many off-station trials, and do they compare? We never did. We never did off-station trials with soybeans. Huntley can sometimes be a little higher on some of those trials. I mean, on various crops. I think our I think our soybean data is very representative. You're probably thinking of our of our winter wheat data, particularly our dryland winter wheat data, and the reason for that. There's a couple of reasons. 
Uh, we're not on a true glacial till soil. We're kind of that end of the side of the station is in a transition between the alluvial deposits of the Yellowstone and the glacial till hills that, that are just to the south of us. And so we've got what I'm saying is we've got deeper soils than you typically would have up in the dry land areas. That's part of it. And and thanks to NRCS and some cost share, we have more and more center pivots that are around us. And I think there is some moisture moving through that. And winter wheat, you know, if you get winter wheat seeded early enough and you got good growing conditions, it'll root five, six feet deep. So I think we're getting into some moisture zones there that have not been documented. So it's the plots are small. And, and they're smaller. There is some inflation from that. Yeah, there is. But, you know, you know, six, I mean, I mean, I'm talking about six. Plots. I'm talking about 60 bushels, though, on at least on a larger scale basis, too. Five so. to ten acres, you want up to ten yeah. acres, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. so. A lot of it is just. <laughs> I'll take that as a compliment. <laughs> yes, I know there are there are some economies of scale concerning size that are both positive and negative. I'll put it that way. Yes. Double zeros and early single zeros can be used to avoid early frost and also facilitate early harvest. So that's what we're going to see. So what we're saying is, uh, I think I've, I've been changing my story a little bit. I've been saying 180 to 220 K on six inch row spacings. Uh, plant less with wider row spacings. So we've been down about that 150 K here, 160 here and, and, you know, when we have gone to wider row spacings. We have some fields that don't flood irrigate very well unless we use row spacings and so on planted rows. And so uh, inoculate. I can't stress this enough. And yes? On your flooding, are you flat planting them and ditching them? Are you ditching them the fall before? No, well, on our flat plant, we treat them just like malt barley. We're putting in dikes and we're flooding them right across the flat. Okay. And they take it quite well. Yes, that they do They do take flooding much better than other pulses like peas and you, you know, you'll, you'll kill a pea plant if you let that water stand out there. I haven't experienced that with, with soybeans. But I don't let them go days either. You know, oh, inoculation. Got to inoculate. And my advice to you is, is, is we did have some inoculation studies for about two years. And the reason why we quit those is because once you inoculate, that bacteria does stay persistent in the soil. In fact, if you, if you develop a rotation where you're consistently producing soybeans, I would say if you inoculate twice, and if you continue to grow soybeans, you probably won't have to inoculate ever again. Or, or if you, or if your rotation gets out of whack, inoculate once every you know, five years, or six years, whatever it is that you happen to be you know, involved. You, know, you, you think. Uh, bottom line is, after two years, we could we stopped getting a response to inoculum, so we just gave, gave up on it. So, so that's it. There are products out there that have what is called a, a USDA improved Brady rhizobium. And those products do work. They are superior uh, in my mind. And they come in all three forms. They come in peat, they come in liquid, they come in granular. And I've had the best luck with granular put in the furrow at planting. I know peat is more convenient. Scatter it in the box, start drilling. But I've, my experience with peat, and this goes back a long ways, long, long ways, uh, when we used to inoculate alfalfa at home. Uh, basically, you know, if you check the box halfway down the field, it's gone. You know, it, it settles out, and, and, and all of it gets planted in the up air end of the field or, or half of the field. Liquids, liquids, and particularly in this country, you know, they've been promoting liquids that you put on the seed. The minute that dries, you, bacteria are starting to die. And so th then it becomes an issue of are you going to get enough back, have enough bacteria still alive by the time you get that planted in the ground and there's enough moisture to keep that going. Uh, and we've, we've, that's, that's probably be, we've had some success with liquids do, using that, and then we've had a lot of failures. So, so it's, it's, kind of, it's probably the most variable form of doing that. I was just at the, uh, the pea growers meeting last week in Great Falls and I noticed that there's a lot of companies selling products that say they're doing improved and they maintain the viability of bacteria on the seed. And that might be true, but I haven't seen any scientific data. They, none of them had scientific data to show that that was in fact the case. So there was, there was something things. when we were raising some lentils that they were talking about how the soybean inoculant is much more viable, lives a lot longer than uh, than the, than the lentil, the pea and lentil inoculant. 
for whatever reason. I can't uh, remember why. I, I've never heard that. I've never seen that. So I, I, can't, I can't really respond to that. I, I would say the one thing that I would tell you to definitely avoid is that some people sell inoculum. It's a generic inoculum. They say it inoculates all things. Wheat, barley, beans, soybeans, dry beans. In my mind, that's all a waste of money. I've yet to see a crop develop viable nodules, a soybean crop, using that kind of product. So, so that's uh, herbicide restrictions. Some of you were asking earlier about chlorpyrrolid and some other things. So yes, you, there are some. They are legumes, so you have to consider some some rotation restrictions. Uh, but a number of the SUs and imidazolones are registered on soybeans, and so if you check those labels, you'll find out there's not as many restrictions. Chlorperilid is the big one, Stinger, uh, for, for that we use primarily for Canada thistle control that I worry about more than anything. Or Nortron, back in the days when we were using lots of Nortron. Nortron, things like you won't have a soybean crop with that. Uh, I don't think many of you use that anymore. Uh, crop quality has been actually it's been more than acceptable. It's been fantastic, uh, and as at, and this slide, market opportunities have not developed, but that has changed in the last thirty days. So, are there any questions? Everything was conventional tilled, and the fertilizer you put down was worked in. Yes, 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 and, and under irrigation. Yes. What was your plant date? Uh, if I back up those slides, typically we're planting in the first 10 days in May. Uh, our, killing, our last killing frost happens on about May 10th, May 11th, May 12th. And, and I try to plant so that those are cracking through at about that period of time. If you have cotyledons above ground with a killing frost, you will lose soybeans. Yes. They're not like peas. You will lose soybeans. They take they take fr killing frost at cracking better than dry beans do, though. So, based on experience, but don't don't plant them saying, thinking that they're immune to frost. They're not. Yeah. Have you done any tests on soil compaction? We have not. I haven't done any. Nothing intentional. <laughs> okay. So we, after a wet beet harvest. That's what I'm. No. Uh, what we did is again because it's conventional tillage in an irrigated scenario. Uh, we had one year where we had, and it was kind of unusual, we had an, er, actually it was an early hail storm, pea-sized hail, it just beat the ground down. We already planted our soybeans and just beat it flat. And we had crusting that they had trouble coming through. And we actually went out and, uh, and had a, we had a light rotary harrow that we went across it with to kind of bust that up, open that up a little bit. And that, but that was one year out of 11 that we had that problem. So yes, crusting can be an issue. And we talked about, uh, the gentleman talked about soil health a little bit earlier. Uh, in those rotation blocks where I now have had soybeans, in some cases seven, eight years, our, our, our organic matter levels in those soils have jumped from 1, 1.1, 1 1.2. We're now up to 2.5 to home, approaching 3% on those after 10 years. So just having those in the rotation, of course, we're, we're incorporating all of our, our residue back into the soil so that it does uh, melt down, followed by sugar beets. Of course, sugar beets, you know, it's tough to do no-till with sugar beets in the rotation, so, but soybeans do work really well with no-till as well. Any other questions? You had soybeans right following corn? I'd have to go back to my production records. I'm just a little worried about harvesting with no behind no till soybeans in the corn. No till soybeans in the corn stubble. In the corn stubble. Mm -hmm. I think that would work marvelously well. How about cutting them on the ground next year? Well, yeah, you're gonna have the, that corn stubble, that residue going through, but by the time you get the soybean harvest, there isn't gonna be hardly any I mean, that's it's gonna be heavily skeletonized. I can't imagine that that's gonna stop a header. We've seen that with peas planted no-till into grain corn, and it's amazing how, if you have a little health in your soil, how that decomposes that corn plant. So 
And what crop was this? Well, I think the fact that you're trapping moisture in that canopy but in the soybeans, I, I think that, that corn, if you find anything, I think you, I would be surprised. Yeah. Well, I've done spring with after corn no till for several years and now it's very well, but you know, you're cutting your weed up six inches at the minimum. I try to leave as much straw as I can. Yeah, and you are cutting them lower, yeah. Have you grown any under the sprinkler, or have they all been flood? Uh, they've all been flood. They've all been flood. Well, we shouldn't we think we see any increased um, fungus or anything? The one disease that we would now, soybeans are susceptible to white mold, and so in a sprinkler situation, I would be concerned about that. We have not seen white mold under flood, even where we're putting them under dikes. Uh, the flower tissue, I don't know if you've ever seen the flowers of, of soybeans, you have to look really hard to find them. They're teeny, teeny, like a pencil point almost. There's, there's almost nothing to the flower. And of course, on white mold, the primary infection site is the flower petal. And then it spreads from there. And usually, you know, like on canola, where all the flower petals fall down to the base of the plant, and you irrigate it, that's, you get so much white mold because that's the primary inoculum. You've just scattered it on the ground at the base of the plants. And so we have not seen that now, but I have heard, I have heard that that is the one concern we would have under sprinkler irrigation would be, would be that. Rains every day in Iowa anyway. Can't be any worse than the. And rain. and and white mold and 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 what well, they have another one a similar disease called charcoal rot and stem rot that also is bad and that's for that reason because it, you know if they get into rainy periods, in Iowa, or or in the mid Midwest yes. And higher humidities, I think, give you that. Yeah, spit particularly spread. nighttime humidities. Mm -hmm. That we usually don't have to deal with. No, humidity. you turn off the sprinklers and things dry pretty fast, you know, so. Any other questions before I hit the road? So you're not going to have to drive me to Laurel, no? Okay, one last thing I was going to say, because of the interest in soybeans, we are, we have made a commitment to crank the program back up, particularly on variety testing. So we're going to try and bring back variety testing to the station starting this spring. The, the, the unknown is how well will industry respond to that, because when you're dealing mostly with private breeders, again, it's, you know, what, you know, do we want stuff tested for a market that really doesn't exist? acres that doesn't exist, you know, that, and we've, we've struggled with that even in our corn program uh, because, the you know, the guys that run the submissions for corn, look at Montana, you know, you're talking 100, at most 150,000 acres of corn in Montana. That's not even a county in Iowa, you know, so, so they, they just have very little interest in it. But we're going to try and twist some arms and see if we can't get some support for that. How many years did you say it's been in trials up there? We did it for 11 years, 99 to 2009. I would encourage you, if you're interested in this, contact uh, uh, B.J. DeLeo at Pompey's Pillar and ask him what, you know, what, they, what the specifications are that they're calling for on the contracts. I've seen that. There's nothing there's nothing unusual in there, but you know, if you're not used to growing or marketing soybeans, there are some things in there that you have to consider in that. You know, things splits and you know, you've dealt with them in other crops, but you just gotta think about that ahead of time. So I would advise you to do that. And what the, I still don't know what they're if they're gonna change their pricing structure. I know it's still gonna be based off the futures market. I, I sold mine a month ago, and mm -hmm. I got a minus 65 basis. You said you just I just got 80, and we delivered those just a week ago. And if I had sold mine a month earlier, they had a minus 50 basis for five months. So they're, so they're changing yeah. things as they get into this. Yeah. And soybeans have been jumping quite a bit. You know, This spring in May, if I had the courage, I could have contracted for 1150 at moments. Yeah, and, but you sold yours a month ago. What was market at that time? About more like 950? No, market was 1016. I hit a high day there, but oh, okay. I, I ended up with 951. 
just a couple okay. cents above more than what we have. But you you had a lot higher market price than I did. Yeah, yeah. So till right now, I was kicking myself. I didn't wait till now because I'm just delivering now. But I, you I paid more basis. Like yeah, you paid more basis. So very good. So how many acres did you grow? I just had sixty last year. Happy with them? Yeah. Which what did they yield? A little over fifty. I think you can do better. Yeah. yeah, there was there was about 18 acres on the bottom side that only yield about 34. That was I blame that on my fault. It was bad wheat pressure when I was young. Yeah. And that really stunned him with that. Yeah. If you're concerned about Roundup Ready uh, using Roundup in the rotation, if you really just take a few minute, minutes and look at the arsenal of what we have available in soybeans, there's a lot of things that we can put on particularly if you're willing to put on things like, as a pre-emergent uh, that go a long way to, to deal with that herbicide resistant issue. One of my favorite combos right now is, is, is Prowl and Outlook combined together, pint of each, put on pre-emergent. Man, I got no kochia, no lamb's quarter, no pigweed. It, no it, it, and there's no rotational restrictions on that. It all it's all gone. And by by the time you get row closure, it's it's as it's starting to break down, then the crop competition's kicking in. And if you have to clean it up, one shot of Roundup takes care of that, and you're off and running. So it that that's been my favorite here one at least. We've had experience with Valor. That's another one that's also very good. And then there's a I mean there's a whole bunch of them out there. Is that spring applied pre-plant? Pre-emergence is most of those pre after, after you after you plant. Yeah. Some of them do have pre-plant labels. Uh, it's not as effective because you understand if you go out and spray the barrier down and you plant, you're, you're breaking that. It's just like you're, you're cutting a knife through a piece of plastic. You're opening up that barrier. If you plant, then spray, then you set down that barrier, then and you don't have to it takes it, it, it yeah, it takes a little moisture to activate it, but it do, doesn't take that much, I've discovered. And, and so it's, it's been phenomenal. In fact, I didn't spray Roundup last year, the, that Prowl Outlook combination. I had it on a piece of ground where we had taken out you know, the can of the thistle and all of that, and we, we pretty much had perennials under control. And I didn't have any annual broadleaves out there. It's just unbelievable. Gentlemen, I need to run, so thank you, so thank you very much.